so good afternoon good afternoon ladies and gentlemen good afternoon thank you so very much for attending this Vrienden van Copenhagen lecture already for the fourth time and I was just wondering during uh, the coffee I was just wondering around a little bit and asking some of you why are you here what is it you will try to find this afternoon are there specific questions or issues you would like to uh, talk about. And then most of you said, well, there are two things why we are here. We are very attracted by today's theme about the pros and cons about urbanization, because, well, if you just follow the news and the latest newspapers, then there is a wide discussion going on when it comes to urbanization. But at the other hand, everybody of you said and replied immediately, we are here because now we can meet up and catch up with our old friends, which is, of course, a very, very important reason to be here this afternoon. Well, my name is Simon van Trier, and I have the great honor to be your moderator for this afternoon. And one of my tasks is to make sure that there is some room and some time for Q&A. Because this theme, after having heard our keynote speaker and the elderman of the municipality of the city of Tilburg, I think it will be very interesting to also hear your opinion about what has been said here on stage. So, we will start, and I am looking for of course, Director Magnificus for the Tilburg University for a true word of welcome as well as a short insight in this afternoon's program. So, Professor Klaus Seitzma, please step on stage. The floor is yours. You can give him a hand of applause. Yes. Well, thank you very much to start with. Welcome, everybody. It is wonderful to have you all here today at the fourth Copenhagen lecture, which focuses on urban society. This event joins alumni, especially Vrienden van Copenhagen, and colleagues, staff, and students. It gives me special pleasure to see so many alumni return to their alma mater on this occasion. The lecture is an initiative of the alumni network Vrienden van Copenhagen and Tilburg University Society, together with our Development and Alumni Relations Office. It introduces highly innovative international speakers and contributes to creating a future-proof ecosystem for Tilburg University. In the past years, we welcomed Dani Rodrik, who spoke on the rights and wrongs of economic science, Victor Meyer Schoenberger on digital society, and Anna Appelbaum, I don't know if I have to pronounce this as if she is German or American or English, Anna Appelbaum, I will say, on democracy and disinformation. This year we are proud to welcome Edward Glazer, and I'm pronouncing that name correctly, in our midst to discuss the pros and cons of urbanization. Edward Glaser is Professor of Economics at Harvard University's Faculty of Arts and Sciences, where he has been working since 1992. Glaser gives many lectures on microeconomics complemented by urban and public economics. He was director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and director of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. He has published dozens of articles on economic growth and the law and the economy of cities. His work focused in particular on the determinants of urban growth and the roles of cities as centers of idea transfer. After the lecture by Professor Glazer, we will focus somewhat sharper on urbanization and aim the spotlight on the city of Tilburg. Berend de Vries will provide us with this view. Berend is alderman of the Municipal Council of Tilburg since 2010. He's also an alumnus of the Tilburg Law School of our university. His portfolio contains economy, energy, transition, and urban planning. Who else than Berend de Vries can take us on a journey through Tilburg? I would like to elaborate also a little on our alumni. I can't ignore that, of course, and I won't. Today, we have more than 70,000 alumni, which is an impressive number. 
In addition to now serving, so today serving 18,000 registered students on our campus, last year showed several records in the history of Tilburg University. One was that we received the highest number of donations ever, and that is something we applaud, of course. Another was that the highest number of, the highest number of alumni, alumni ever supported our students as mentor or coach or helping as volunteers with events. By sharing your skills, knowledge, networks, and your feedback, you actively help advancing our students and society. Tilburg University is grateful for these efforts and for the fi financial support received through the University Fund. This fund creates scholarships for students and funds for research and education projects. Having mentioned your wonderful contributions, please don't hesitate to continue joining us by providing your experience, ideas, networks, and funding. More means help us making ourselves even more useful by supporting people who need this the most. Ladies and gentlemen, alumni, thank you very much, all of you. It is heartwarming knowing that you are so strongly committed to your university, our university. Shortly, we will start with the lectures. First, I give the floor to alumnus Piet Heinroorda, chairman of the Vrienden van Copenhagen. I wish you a wonderful and highly, highly enjoyable afternoon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Klaas, for welcoming us and mentioning the importance of the alumni network for the university. On behalf of the board of the Vrienden van Kobbehagen, it is with pride and pleasure to welcome you all and have you here this afternoon for the fourth Vrienden van Kobbehagen lecture. As you all may know, for 20, uh, 28 years, the Vrienden have been closely connected to each other and to our alma mater. As an alumni network, we connect graduates of all schools and program, programs of Tilburg University. We organize various events throughout the year to strengthen our network and to connect uh, to students, young alumni, and employees of Tilburg University, as we are today. Uh, some events are specifically for members of our network, or as we call them, vrienden, and some events we support as Vrienden van Kobbehagen and are organized by Tilburg University itself. On other events we organize together, such as the Coach Cafés and today's lecture. Uh, many of you participated earlier this afternoon in one of the parallel sessions addressing different aspects related to the theme of this afternoon, urban society. And I'm sure you've had an interesting session, at least I did, and good discussions on these topical issues already. The keynote, however, of this afternoon is a topical issue in these turbulent times. For example, many cities in the Netherlands have presented ambitious building plans to fulfill the growing need for housing in the Netherlands. We're very honored that in cooperation with Tilburg University Society, as well as the Development and Alumni Relations Office, we have succeeded to attract the international renowned Professor Edward Glazer this afternoon from Harvard University to give a lecture about urbanization and its pros and cons. Professor Glazer has been looking forward to come to Tilburg, as he told me during lunch, and to again spend time in the great urban environment of the Netherlands. And subsequently, Berend de Vries, Alderman of Economic Affairs, Circular Economy and Spatial Planning, will share his thoughts and discuss the theme from the point of view uh, from Tilburg. Um, further, I would like to take this opportunity to show the events we have planned for this year. And um, as you can see in bronze, you will find all the events for the members or potential members. And um, in blue, all the events we organize together with the university. And specifically, I would like to mention the Coast Cafe, uh, in which the uh, students can meet members, Vrienden van Kobbehagen, 
and discuss with them uh, what the, um, <clears throat> the Vrienden encountered in their careers, uh, what, what their uh, possible pitfalls were in their career, etc. Um, what I also would like to mention is the boardroom meetings uh, we have, and I think we have a very nice uh, and interesting boardroom meeting at uh, the company called Lightyear. Uh, one of uh, the alumnus, Lens uh, Melze, is um, working there. Um, they are manufacturing solar cars at the uh, high-tech campus of uh, Eindhoven. Um, and last but not least, uh, another type of event we organize is uh, meeting Professor Boudewijn Havenkort, um, who will tell us more about cyber physical systems. So this really, I think, shows that we have a big variety in our program. And, um, well, I would like to encourage everybody uh, who is not a member yet uh, from the Vrienden van Kobbehagen to enlist. Um, and even our membership fee is tax deductible, so it's uh, really a bargain if you would join our program, uh, giving all the lunches, dinners, and drinks we also serve uh, during our events. Um, on behalf of the Vrienden van Kophagen, I, would, uh, I hope you will have uh, an interesting and wonderful day at our university, and I hope to see you at one uh, of the other events uh, this year. And really feel free to uh, contact me uh, later today or one of my fellow board members uh, to ask about uh, the alumni activities uh, that we uh, um, yearly organize and if you would like uh, to join. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Pietijn Roorda and Klaas Heitsma. Thank you so much. Tax deductible. Yeah, that's, that's fun. It must be at this university of economics, and I saw Ed saying like, well, this is Dutch to talk about these kind of things, but it's about time that we are going to meet Ed Glazer, because as I said, in the run-up to this meeting for this afternoon, um, well, I at least, I did follow the media and the news a little bit specifically on this today theme, like pros and cons of urbanization, and I must say that it's more cons than pros if you do read the newspapers. Um, we have wide discussions when it comes to, for example, nurses and teachers not able anymore to find a living space downtown Amsterdam. They are forced to go out, although they are needed within the borders of the city. Then that tremendous nuisance caused by tourists, by Airbnb tourists, really disrupting the residential way of living in our cities. Um, the enormous lack of, and it was already mentioned, of living areas. We must build, we must build one million units. Can you imagine what that does mean? All those kinds of things, and then often all these discussions are ended by the general consensus that people say, what has all this to do with the quality of, of our lives? Because apparently the quality of life is at stake, and that all has to do with these economics of urbanization. And that's why we are so very happy to have Edward Glazer with us here this afternoon because we kindly invite him to talk and share his latest insights when it comes about the determinants of urban growth. What is it? Is it something which just rolls over us because time goes by and world population grows? Or is it something which is intended or unintended, the result, the consequence of our human behavior, of our policy making? What is it? So, there's a lot to discuss, there's a lot to learn, there are a lot of insights, and here he is for us here this afternoon. Please, warm welcome for Edward Glazer. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, those kind introductions. Thank you all so much for spending this time uh, with me. It's been six years since I've been in Tilburg. I was here the last time talking about the incredible economic engine that is the Brabant region uh, at the first uh, Copenhagen summit. Um, today I'm going to be speaking more generally about the upsides and downsides of, of urbanization. But I do want to call out one very local thing that was highlighted in the introduction, which is I'm a small reason why you're here. The larger reason is to connect with each other. That is urban density at work. And the fact that you value face-to-face -face contact with each other is a sign of what makes cities great and what makes cities important. 
Now, I want to start by making the point that cities rest on a three-legged stool, on, on a tripod. Um, the first leg of which is the magic of human interactions. It's the fundamental pro of cities that on some level outweighs all of the cons. It's the fact that we are at our hearts uh, a puny species when we are alone. Few people in this room could keep up with a decently sized bear if we, were, we were, had no other help. But collectively, we've been able to work miracles. Work miracles in technology, work miracles in governance, work miracles in culture. And I can think of few, few countries that embody the magic that comes out of urban interactions, the collaborative chains of creativity that have powered humanity's greatest hits from Athenian philosophy to Facebook than the Netherlands. This is one of the world's great urban societies. And when we think about things like uh, democracy in its modern form, that is something that is created by the urban spaces and the urban residents of the Netherlands as they rose up against their non-urban overlords in the, in the late 16th century. Um, those interactions are captured in this slide by the old market of Jerusalem, which captures one way in which cities enable people to become better than they would as individuals by buying and selling. But of course, there are many other ways. There's the chance encounter with a friend who teaches you something. There's the warm smile of a neighbor who makes your life a, life a little bit better. But as the introduction emphasized, there are also downsides of density. Right? If someone is close enough to give you an idea face to face, they're also close enough to give you a virus or a bacteria. And if someone's close enough to sell you a newspaper, they're close enough to rob you. Right? Cities have for thousands of years been trying to deal with those downsides of density. And that is why cities need rules and an effective public sector. And one way to understand all these cons that are in the news today is that the public sector has not caught up with private sector success. That in fact, dealing with the downsides of density felt like a much less difficult thing in the 1970s and 1980s when the urban world seemed to be over. But today we're in a world in which demand to be in Amsterdam is huge. And so we need public policies that are around that. In my picture here, I have, uh, this is an image of the Boston and, and Cambridge Police Departments dealing with the marathon bombing uh, from five or six years ago. Uh, it's one example of the many ways in which cities have to deal with these demons that come with density, what economists call the negative externalities associated with having people around you. The third image right, is the third leg of the stool, which is the built environment. Economists are always fond of reminding architects that the real city is not the skyline. The real city is not even the beautiful homes al along the canals that we all, all remember from Amsterdam. The real city is humanity. The real city is the flesh and blood that is connected by that density. And structures don't work unless they actually serve the needs of the people. But of course, people do need structures and infrastructure. They do need houses. Uh, they do need space. They do need commuting areas. They need to be able to walk to places. They need to be able to drive to places in some cases. right? And cities need to build to accommodate change. And if you think about the fundamental reason for the housing crisis in the Netherlands, it's fundamentally because the amount of new construction has not kept up with the amount of demand for these spaces. And I have no idea where the Netherlands should build. That's not my job to tell you where you should build, how to figure this out. And in many cases, the challenges here are much harder than the US because you have precious urban spaces that must be protected. Right? Uh, but not every urban space in the Netherlands can be, can be precious. And you need to find some areas in which to allow the high levels of density that are needed to allow cities to accommodate the people who want to come into them. So it's about this triad. And now I'm going to take you on a tour, first a little bit about why cities have come back, and then diving into the discontents of modern urbanization, then diving into the cons. Now, fundamentally, the ebb and flow of urban growth is about a dance with technology. Cities are formed by the technological events during their era. Um, this is one of the first great centripetal technologies. I'm going to dif differentiate between centripetal technologies that pull us together and centrifugal technologies that push us apart. Right? Uh, this is an aqueduct, probably the single most important pro-urban technology ever, because there is no more important job for urban government than providing clean water. Um, this is the one in Segovia. It's also fairly splendid in its way. Um, but this was a technology that enabled cities to form. Indeed, the 19th century was a great centripetal century. 
technology starting with horse-drawn omnibuses, moving into steam-powered factories that could be located in urban cores, moving to uh, elevated railroads, and then, of course, the skyscraper, right? This great invention that married a steel frame structure that enabled you to soar to the sky with the safety elevator that enabled you to travel up and down at reasonable speeds. Um, this was an innovation that enabled cities to sprout up in a way that was unimaginable before 1850. Of course, the 20th century, particularly in America, was a centrifugal century because it was a century in which many of the most powerful technologies caused the death of distance. Right? The car was very much a child of the city. It was a child, first of all, of urban Germany, right? something Americans tend to forget, that in fact it was Germans who came up with the internal combustion engine, not Americans. But of course, we did make it cheap. Right? Detroit may have been the most productive place on the planet in 1950, and in the 1890s it was a place no less entrepreneurial than Silicon Valley in the 1960s. Right? There was a genius on every street corner, not just Henry Ford, but the Dodge brothers, the Fisher brothers, Billy Durant, Ransom E. Olds, right? and collectively they figured out how to make an inexpensive automobile for ordinary Americans. But this invention that came from the city was a, a deeply problematic child in that what the car enabled Americans to do was to rebuild their urban spaces around the automobile. And that's exactly what we did throughout the entire 20th century. Right? We left our old urban spaces and we rebuilt our cities around the car, which is something that America still has to deal with. Right? And, and indeed, the, the difference between the American urban structure and that in Europe reflects the fact that so much of our cities were built during the 20th century where the car was dominant and where transportation costs were low enough so you could have one large city surrounded by empty space. Whereas the, the cities of Northern Europe were formed during a time of very high transportation costs, and so of course they have lots of little cities everywhere because transportation costs were very high. Um, so cars and highways also had the effect of killing the older industrial cities. You know, every one of America's largest cities in 1900 was on a major waterway because those waterways enabled the flow of goods and indeed then rail cars then backed up this water power. The decline in transportation costs, highways, containerization, right, cheaper trucking, cheaper railroads, enabled industry to leave those urban cores and move to places where labor was cheaper. So first it moved to the suburbs, then it moved to so-called right-to-work states in the South where labor unions were not empowered. The work of Tom Holmes compares areas on different sides of state boundaries and shows how much more industry grew uh, after the, the passage of, of the Taft-Hartley uh, Act that enabled right-to-work states. And of course it moved to lower cost areas across the globe. Right. Uh, and by that, this was the largest industrial cluster in the, 19, in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production uh, in Detroit, but it was garment production, the sewing of clothes in New York in the 1950s. This was an industry that lost 500,000 jobs in under six years, right? just hammered by globalization. And indeed, was, when I was growing up in New York in the 70s, this was very much a feeling that New York was a city whose time had come and gone, and it was a dinosaur looking at the trash heap of history. And of course, this was not something that was unusual in urban Europe as well. This is an image of Liverpool from the 1980s, where particularly older industrial cities felt as if they were completely headed for the trash heap uh, of history. Now, when I started in this business in the late 1980s, there was a fashionable view that said, just as containerization and highways had eliminated urban industry, new forms of transmitting knowledge over space would kill off urban finance, would kill off urban consulting, would kill off urban publishing, would kill off all of the idea-intensive industries that still existed in cities. And this was a deeply fashionable view. This was, of course, the high-tech information technology of the 1980s, so just to remind you of what that, what that looked like. Um, but I thought, looking at that, that this didn't seem right to me, um, that, in fact, this would not happen as the world get, got more technologically sophisticated. And I've been pleased that I was right, that, in fact, the last 25 years, the trend has not been centrifugal. The cent trend has been centripetal. And we see things like this is the Wallace office at Bloomberg City Hall. This is uh, the Googleplex in, ca in California. We see the rise of urban spaces both in the US and in Europe, and even more so in the developing world, where you know, massive cities from Karachi to Kinshasa show up in places that are both poor and sadly too often poorly governed. Right? It has been an urban quarter century, and it's been quite remarkable. So why didn't information technology kill off face-to-face -face interactions and the cities that enable those interactions? Well, I think the dominant effect of globalization and new technologies has been to radically increase the returns to being smart, to radically increase the returns to human capital. Right? We have literally thousands of studies showing that being smarter is now worth a lot more than it used to be. 
and we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. This is what cities do that matters. And they always did this, right? They always enabled these chains of, of creativity. But in 15th century Florence, or in 15th century Bruges for that matter, that produced spectacular art, but it did not create the economic engine. The economic engine would have been around weaving, right? I mean, it was about a much more, not, not the chains of brilliance, but the core economic function. In the 21st century, those chains of brilliance, right, the chains of new ideas, that's what powers the economy. That what's, that's what makes Eindhoven work. It's not about making ordinary goods more cheaply. It's about collaborative brilliance. Um, another way to think about this is as the world becomes more complicated, we have more complex ideas that are easier to get lost in translation, right? Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your students at all, at all, okay? And we have these wonderful cues as, as humans for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. All of you surely know that if you're gonna have a difficult conversation with someone, you wanna do it face to face, not over Twitter. Okay? You want to actually have some ability to see how it's impacting the person and adjust your message. As the whole world gets more tech complicated, as technology gets more complicated, those face-to-face -face interactions have become more valuable, not less valuable. And you see this right, in these two images. So this is the Bloomberg's uh, Wallace office at, the, at the City Hall in New York, um, which is based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP, his company, which was based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor which Bloomberg ran before he went off and, and started his own business. Um, now, trading floors are something of a puzzle. Here we have some of the wealthiest people on the planet who in a normal industry would be sitting in a large office protected by a giant oaken desk, enjoying all the privacy that their wealth has made possible. But here they are in a trading floor, they're on top of each other. They're yelling at each other, they're getting food on each other, it's all a mess, right? Why are they there? Well, they're there because in their industry, right, knowledge is incredibly valuable. Knowing a little bit more of what's going on in the markets can make you a fortune overnight, which is why finance tends to be so urban, because the urban edge in transmitting information is so valuable there. They're there fundamentally because knowledge is more important than space. And that's what's happened over the last quarter of a century, is that cities have come back because economic changes have favored knowledge, they favored innovation. And if you really thought that new technologies were making face-to-face -face interaction obsolete, then what in the world is Google doing buying the Googleplex, building even larger structures so that everyone's on top of each other, buying a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan? Why are they doing all this? Because they know this is how their creative business works. They want their people as often as they can next to each other. They want no barriers between them. They want the flow of information to be as complete as it can. They want to create the experience of an urban work environment where knowledge flows quickly. So, uh, and this is the background for what we've seen over the last 20 years. So this is a map of the US, and what I've done is I've taken the uh, 3,000 odd counties in the United States, uh, each one on average with about 100,000 people. Each dot uh, takes one-tenth of those counties, so 300 counties. And uh, I've sorted them in the basis of their density levels. So what the blue line shows is the relationship between density and earnings. And of course, I've used density because at their heart, cities are density. They're the absence of physical space between people and firms. They are density, proximity, closeness. And what the blue line shows is that the densest tenth of America's counties have earnings that are on average 50 percent higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is something economists call agglomeration economies, and it reflects a lot of things. It reflects the fact that sometimes people in cities are better educated. It reflects the fact that, you know, uh, there may be other forms of selection on, on attributes into cities. But after 30 years of research on this, I think we're fairly convinced that this is actually a treatment effect, that actually people who move to cities actually do experience real visible wage gains. And they're not wage gains that happen overnight, but rather year by year, month by month, Workers who come to cities experience faster wage growth, which is most compatible with the view that cities are forges of human capital, places where people get smart by being around other smart people. The top line, the red line, is slightly more surprising, which is the relationship between density and population growth. So whereas at the start of the 19th century, Americans were leaving their dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we are clustering in. This is the same graph for the European Union, okay? So these are the nuts three regions. The blue line shows the relationship between earnings and density. It is stronger in the European Union than it is in the US. So I said 50% higher. In the EU, it's double, 
it's double at the top than it is at the bottom. So the earnings gap is really huge. The population relationship is weaker because, in fact, population growth is not driven by differences in fertility in, in Europe or the US. It's driven by migration rates, and Europeans migrate much less than Americans do. Um, I'm not going to mention as much about the developing world. Uh, ho hopefully, something will come up in, in the Q&A. But many of the most exciting things that are happening in cities are happening in the developing world. Um, it is both saddening when you see some of the downsides of urbanization, but it's important to remember there is no pathway out of poverty into prosperity that does not run through city streets. Right? 2007, we crossed this halfway point where the majority of humanity lives in cities, and it's hard not to think that that's on net a good thing, because when you compare those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the more urbanized countries have income levels that are on average five times higher and infant mortality levels that are less than one third. And it's striking, right, when we think about the quality of life problems in developing world cities, that in fact, people in urban areas in the developing world are actually happier than rural dwellers. And that's exactly what this gra graph shows. So what I've taken is, th this is from the World Value Survey. Uh, it's from about 10 years ago, more, uh, 15, 14 years ago. Uh, the gap here shows the difference between rural and urban happiness in the country. So in wealthy countries, there's no big difference. You should not expect to be happier by moving to one place versus not. Uh, uh, reminding you that I'm an economist, not a lifestyle consultant. Uh, the, um, so these are all clustered around zero. Some places like Italy and New Zealand, uh, the urbanites are less happy than the rural dwellers. Or rural New Zealand is pretty nice, as is rural Italy. And of course, in Sweden, uh, as anyone can imagine what rural Sweden is like during January, uh, the urbanites are much happier than the rural dwellers. Um, but the place where you see really a huge gap is in the poor parts of the world. Um, India, Ghana, Mali, Mo Moldova, Rwanda, these are places where there's a huge happiness gap despite the pain of living in an Indian slum. It beats the unending, stultifying poverty of rural India. Um, the only exceptions are Iraq and Thailand. Iraq was in 2005, during 2007, experiencing what economists would call certain exogenous negative shocks to their cities. Other people call that bombing. Uh, and of course, Thailand, uh, we, I claim, is, uh, I, I attribute this to Bangkok's traffic jams. Now, the success of cities in the 21st century is not uniform. It's not as if every city does, does well. Um, you know, uh, it's Detroit, Cleveland, uh, these are still places that are troubled. Liverpool is not back, no matter what you hear from the occasional capital culture year that Liverpool experienced. Um, uh, but some places, it's easy to forget now, but in 1971, two jokers put up a billboard, a sign on the highway leaving Seattle, asking the last person to leave the city to turn out the lights. Right? Because just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. Before Amazon, before Costco, before Starbucks, before Microsoft, right? and this is Milan as well, reinventing itself like Seattle as a former decaying industrial town into a cultural capital of the information age. What is the magic sauce? It's education. Human capital is the bedrock on which national, individual, and local success rests. Right here, I'm showing you the relationship between per capita GDP and share of the population with a college degree across America's metropolitan areas. This is not just the impact of individual human capital, individual years of schooling. Holding your years of schooling constant in the US, your earnings go up by about 10% as the share of adults in your area with a college degree goes up by 10%. This is something economists call human capital externalities. Um, this is the relationship between human capital and area growth across the US. So you can see these areas which have the highest levels of human capital have population growth that are about four times, three, three and a half times higher than the least educated areas. Right? If you want to understand why Detroit looks different than Seattle, you don't have to look further than more than 50% of Seattle's adults have a college degree. About 13% of Detroit's adults have a college degree. Right? They're doing exactly as well as their education predicts. And indeed, if you think that what cities are doing are enabling people to learn from one another, education is so crucial because it means you've got more to teach and that you're better at learning. Now, the most important things that go on in learning in cities uh, are not the things that we teach in colleges and universities. Uh, despite the incredible value of universities, I just want to make sure the director of Magnifica uh, knows how, how much I'm on board on that. And I, can I remind you that your deduction is tax deductible? Uh, um, the, uh, but beyond that, it's the stuff that's learned at work at the table on city streets. It, what the great English economist Alfred Marshall was talking about when he wrote 130 years ago, that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. And it's that idea of, of knowledge in the air that stands behind this. Now, when it comes to these things that are learned on the street, I can think of nothing that is, no, that is more important and valuable than the knowledge and 
inclination to become an entrepreneur. 60 years ago, the economist Benjamin Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York was more resilient than Pittsburgh was even then. He argued that this was a reflection of that garment industry, which was an industry with very weak returns to scale and no barriers to entry in which anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started. And so it was a mother of entrepreneurial invention. And the entrepreneurs who got started in the garment industry would go on to found movie studios would go on to build skyscraper, would go on to found banks. Right? Over and over again, right, you see these garment industry entrepreneurs going on to do other things. And that is a bedrock that the city relied upon. So when the industry faltered, it had talent that could reinvent itself. Because entrepreneurial human capital is fungible. If it's good at looking for opportunities in clothes, it's good at looking at opportunities in other markets. Whereas by contrast, Pittsburgh has US Steel. US Steel trains company men. They're very good at solving short-run logistics problems. They're very bad at reinventing themselves. It is amazing, given how weak our measures of entrepreneurial talent are at the local level, how powerful they are at predicting urban resilience. In this case, I'm just using average establishment size. This is employment growth. This is the difference between 160% employment growth and 30% employment growth. These are the places with the smallest average establishments. These are the places with the largest average establishments, right? Huge difference. Also, I could measure this with a share of employment in startups in the initial period. Or I could look at proximity to coal mines or iron mines at the start of the 20th century, which also predicts having larger firms. I can look within industries. I can look within uh, geographic regions. All of them show the same things. Lots of little scrappy firms leads to urban resilience, leads to urban reinvention. A few monolithic large companies leads to stagnation. Now, you can make up for that if you have an educated enough population. So Boeing is large, and, and Seattle is a bit of a monolith, but it is sufficiently well-educated that it does all right. Detroit is also a monolith, but it's a monolith with less educated workers, and so it is still dealing with the hangover from that industrial success. Now, uh, one last point about why cities have come back. They have also risen as places of consumption as well as production. Um, they're places that are, it's fun to be. They're, they're places that have fixed, fixed goods, like access to museums or beautiful spaces that we can enjoy. And as the population of the world becomes more educated and more interested in higher end pleasures, right, they want to take advantage not just of competition in urban labor markets, but competition in urban restaurants or among art dealers as well. And so over the last 30 years, we have the rise of cities as places of consumption. Um, which creates added pressure on urban housing markets, because you actually want people not just who are there for their jobs, but people who are there to have fun. One example of this is the rise of reverse commuting. The idea that anyone would live in Manhattan or in the Bronx and then commute out to Westchester would have been thought as completely bizarre in the 1970s. Right? You had to pay people combat pay to make them put up with Manhattan in the 1970s. Right? Today, New York is filled with people who are actually there, and they're there to play, and they go somewhere else to work. And that is what a consumer city looks like. That is some part of what we've seen in terms of the great pro-city price tilt. So this is using Zillow data over the last 20 years. And the high dots there are the places that are right close to the central downtown. And then you can see the price growth declining. So you've seen a real tilt over the last 20 years, whereas the suburbs, which were the great hope of the 50s, 60s, and even early 70s, right, have stagnated. The intra-city, the, the really close in areas, have soared in price, creating both winners and losers. Right? And when you think about what we're, why we think that building is a good idea, it's not just because of the people who live in those houses. It because, it's because it reduces the pressure to gentrify older, cheaper neighborhoods that are close to downtown. Um, Technological change has also made this easier. Zipcar, Airbnb, Uber, well, not in Tilburg. Uh, they, there are a variety of different ways in which we have uh, uh, this sort of rise of a sharing economy. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that sharing economy innovations help cities, because cities have always been examples of a sharing economy. What is an urban restaurant but a, a shared kitchen, a shared dining room? What is an urban park but a shared backyard? Right? The difference is you can share more things. So why didn't you have Zipcar in New York in the 1970s? Well, you'd go to Times Square to pick up your car, and there'd be like a, a dead body in the trunk or something. Right? And, and you know, it was New York in the 70s. For those of you who haven't seen Taxi Driver, right, this is what the city was like. Uh, and it would be a really unpleasant experience. Now with the technology, that doesn't happen. And so we're able to share more things. And that just feeds to city strengths. This is you know, the idea that you would have trusted a stranger to come to your house and pick you up. This is what we thought licensed taxi drivers were like in New York in the 1970s, let alone an unlicensed person who just randomly, randomly showed up. And again, the technology makes us feel comfortable uh, with this. Now, the downside of all this success 
is that the public sector has not kept up with private sector success in cities. We have all of this demand for urban areas that puts stress on the physical city, on the infrastructure, and on this sort of public side of rule keeping, of regulation. And the, the public sector has not kept pace with it. Um, and I'm going to talk about five different examples of this, one of which is more of an issue in the US than it is here, but it is in sort of an important thing everywhere, which is cities seem to be providing productivity but not opportunity, meaning that kids who grow up in urban areas are not seeing the same level of economic benefit that you would expect them to have. Secondly, we're gonna be talking about affordability, of course, and I'll be saying a little bit about Airbnb, uh, the evidence of the US. Third, I'm gonna be talking about non-urban areas, the rise of jobless heartlands outside of, outside of this. Um, I'll say a little bit about congestion and in infrastructure, the traffic difficulties, and rule of law in the city. So uh, here goes. Um, so this comes from this amazing data that my colleague Raj Chetty and Nathan Hendren have put together using linked social security data where they're able to link the income of the parent and the income of the child 30 years later. And so this gives you a measure of upward mobility across the U.S. And with this data, cities look terrible in the U.S. So uh, this is across city population. I could put population density as well. The larger the city, the lower the upward mobility. Um, this is within cities, right? basically flat, and then as you get to very high densities, right, opportunity goes strikingly down. The people who are living in these dense areas are, are doing less well. This is at the border of a central city school district. So we have these, this very sharp uh, geographic definition of where you can go to school in the US. This shows the mobility jump right at the border. So there's a huge jump up, and if you want something even more scary, this is for African Americans. This is the jump in the probability of being in prison in jail as an adult right at the Central City School District. So if you're inside the Central City School District, your probability is 6%. That falls uh, to 5% to if you're outside it, right? So a quite striking regression discontinuity jump right at the city border. Um, this is, in fact, you know, cities have always been places of inequality. And I have always been willing to defend urban equality, right? Er another word for inequality is diversity. Cities attract both rich and poor people. They attract rich people with the ability to spend their money in a fun way. They attract poor people with the promise of upward mobility, with finding a better job, with better social services. All right? But the, the caveat to that is that we only can love urban inequality if it's not permanent. Right? If cities are machines for turning poor people into rich people, if they're providing an upward escalator, then this is something to be admired. If what they're producing is permanent pockets of, of joblessness and, and poverty, then that is something to be deeply worried about. And I think as the European population becomes more heterogeneous, the risk of that goes, goes up. Right? This was always going to be more common in ethnically, homogeneous, ethnically heterogeneous US than in ethnically homogeneous uh, Netherlands. But with different populations moving in, this is something you need to worry more about. So I'll give you three different hypotheses for this. First of all, cities attract the poor, and this represents unobserved parental human capital that is potentially compounded by neighborhood effects in schools. It's possible. Uh, everything we've had suggests that that's, that's um, only a moderate amount of it, particularly for the within city uh, variation. Urban density permits interactions, right? Permits people to buy and sell drugs, right? Permits parents to do things other than taking care of their kids. So for example, I live in an American suburb, and I promise you there's nothing for me to do other than make my kids do their math. Right? I've got no interesting leisure activities other than, other than that. Um, and third, it, urban density enables more segregation, and it is segregation that ultimately uh, lowers upward mobility. Um, we've got a little bit of evidence that really shows that. So this is the level of segregation, and this is upward mobility for African Americans. And so you really do see bigger segregation in American cities, and you can imagine why that would be in a small town. It's hard to be too far away from anyone. The larger the city, the more that you have these isolated pockets. And one fascinating tidbit that comes out of the cell phone data is that adults Right? Poor adults, even poor adults who live in poor neighborhoods, do not live segregated lives. They go to jobs where they interact with rich people, when they interact with well-educated people, but their children do. The children either live in the neighborhood or they go to segregated schools. And so it's a very different world for the adults and for the children. Um, so this is challenge number one. And indeed, it's a challenge that's much more relevant in the US. I would say it's the largest challenge facing cities in the US. It's not the largest challenge facing cities in the Netherlands. Challenge number two is around the built environment. There is a, a scylla and a charybdis, right? There, there are twin dangers around urban land use planning across the world. One of which is nimbyism, not in my backyardism. The other is monumentalism, building for the sake of building, right? Um, this is Mumbai, which is a city which adopted, uh, this is complete insanity, uh, they adopted the British Town and Country Planning Act in 1968, as if any planning that worked well for Yorkshire or Dorset would be appropriate in urban India. 
Uh, they had a floor area ratio limit of 1.25, which means on average, you, know, you can only build to one and a quarter stories. Part of this was driven by sort of a deep hope that this would prevent urban growth. But of course, it didn't prevent urban growth. It just made sure that that growth was as dysfunctional as possible. Because instead of building reasonable towers, right, it sprawled out. It sprawled out and created dysfunctional, uh, underperforming uh, informal slums that just ignore the rules. This is Astana. This is, you know, place number one for monumentalism, right? N nobody needs these towers there. And of course, you see in many parts of the world, particularly less democratic parts, places where there's building for the sake of building. And that is also a, a mistake. Um, uh, I'll give you a little bit on housing markets uh, and how at least I understand them. So this is a, a picture of the great housing convulsion of the 2000 to 2011 period. Along the horizontal axis is the growth in prices between 2001 and 2006. Along the vertical axis is the decline in prices between 2006 and 2011. I want you to take away four facts from this. One, there's huge heterogeneity in American housing markets, right? Some places had incredible booms and busts like New York or Phoenix, and some places like Houston barely moved at all. Typically, the places that build a lot don't have their prices move. Typically, typically, but not always, the places that don't build are the ones where you get the big convulsions. Um, second thing I want you to take away from this, the level of mean reversion. This is normal in housing markets. Typically, for every dollar a housing market sees its price rise over five years, it goes down, housing prices then go down by 32 cents over the next five years, right? So mean reversion is quite normal in housing prices, but this is not 32 cents mean reversion, this is 95 cent mean reversion. This great price wave was a boom and bust that came out leaving nothing but financial wreckage in its wake. Third thing I want you to take away from this, the negative outliers, right? Well, there's Detroit, the one city that managed to miss the boom and still experience the bust, okay? And then there are the cities built on sand, Phoenix and Las Vegas. These were the places that never should have had a boom because in fact, it is easy to build in Phoenix and Las Vegas. There's no lack of American desert land on which you can build forever. And these places have regulations that make it really easy to build. And so for 40 years, prices in Phoenix and Las Vegas were perfectly aligned with construction costs, which in the US means $80 a square foot or $800 a square meter, right? That's, that's what it costs to, uh, to build. Then all of a sudden, right, these places became vastly more expensive and of course it was a bubble that was obviously gonna burst and it did. Last outlier, of course, are the dense areas that retained value, the ones that are above the line, New York, Washington, DC. And that mirrors a broader pattern, which is over the last 20 years, if you ask yourself, where did price growth go? Here I've ordered things on the density, on density level, all of the price growth in America's metropolitan area has been in the places with, with the limited amount of land. Another way of seeing this, right, is that it's really about price growth has been driven by con conflagration, by the combination of demand and supply. But supply matters much more than we would normally think or we historically would have thought. Okay, there are a bunch of areas here along the x-axis is how much permitting there was between 2000 and 2013, so the amount of new building that was allowed by local governments. Along here is the gap between housing price and the physical cost of building. The difference between the value that consumers place on this, this product versus how much it costs to build it. What you notice from here is the places that are really expensive don't build a lot, and the places that, are, are, that build a lot aren't expensive. Okay, there's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. If you have robust demand for an urban space and you don't allow construction, it will get more expensive. And all of the attempts at public policies to rewrite those rules will fundamentally fail. You know, demand side subsidies, cheap mortgage rates for, for buying lending, some form of modest amount of affordable housing units given to a favored few people who get to lottery into it. None of it is a substitute for having a robust private housing supply that makes sure that anyone who comes to your city can rent a home at a reasonable price. And that only comes by actually enabling enough building. Now, the problem is, where can Amsterdam build? Okay, and this is the challenge. And again, as I said before, it's a difference between the US and the Netherlands, because there are small parts of American cities that are historically magical and need to be protected, but they're not huge, right? There's a lot of urban Netherlands that's actually kind of magical, that's kind of patrimony of the world. And so I'm, I'm leaving this to you. You've got to figure this out. I am not going to opine as to which area of urban space is right for you to build on. But you should just keep in mind a little bit of geometry, which is, right, uh, Demographic projections argue for a million more housing units in the Netherlands over some longer, longer time horizon. Um, at 100 square meters per unit, that means 100 square kilometers of space. At, a, at, a, uh, at an FAR of 10, that means you're building to 10 stories on average, you can put that on 10 square kilometers, which is just a circle with a radius of 1.8 meters. So if you're building to an average of 10 stories, that's just a two kilometer radius circle. 
If you're building to five, you need a circle with a, with a diameter of five kilometers, right? So just keep that in mind. The taller building you are, the more you get to keep of this stuff, okay? So you get to keep this stuff if you build up, uh, but the lower you're going to constrain your, ho your housing supply, the lower you're going to constrain heights, the more you're going to eat up of this stuff, or the more you're going to provide, provide uh, limitations on construction. I just want to sort of remind you of this, that, that there's also a profound social justice element of this. Every time you're saying no, to new construction. You're saying no to a family that wants to come and experience urban space. You're saying, you're saying that the families that remain there have to spend more. And there's fundamentally no possible alternative to allowing more construction, to creating cities that are engines of opportunity for a larger number of people. Um, now, Airbnb. Banning Airbnb is, uh, it, I, I'm not even going to call it a Band-Aid. It's like, it's like a, an 18th of a Band-Aid that's put on to how dysfunctional housing markets. I'm not saying it's nothing, and this is more generally about sort of various bans on investment properties, but it's pretty darn small. So I have a PhD student who's just graduating this year who is working on lots of protests on Airbnb rentals in, in the U.S., um, and she goes through a fairly complex mathematical model of estimating this. This, is, this shows you where Airbnb rentals uh, occur in the U.S., uh, occur, in, occur in New York. This is where they're particularly in these downtown areas or in Brooklyn Heights. Um, she estimates that there is a welfare impact that comes from the reduction of housing supply, um, but it's pretty small, right? So the, per year, the median renter loses uh, about $100 per annum from Airbnb. So all of Airbnb is costing the average renter no more than $100 a year. Right? Uh, and that's from a city with a fairly large Airbnb basis. And not only that, and you can see this in the graph, it's actually the rich people who suffer. It's actually rich renters who suffer. And the reason for this is that poor people in New York live here and live here. There's no Airbnb presence there. The Airbnb presence is in the sort of core areas which are you know, areas where nice people live. So it, it's you know, modestly attacking where, where uh, rich people live, which is to say that you may want policies around tourism in uh, Dutch cities. Right? There may be negative externalities associated with, you know, with having people who are coming in and who are behaving in disorderly fashion. As I've tried to emphasize throughout, cities need rules, and particularly if there are tourists who are prone to large amounts of drinking on a, on a weeknight, you may want to impose those rules a little bit more strictly. But trying to outlaw this market, which provides plenty of value uh, in its way, it isn't a solution to any kind of housing market. It's just a convenient scapegoat because you don't actually want to tackle the real problem, which is actually delivering large scales of, of actual affordable housing. Um, third point, what about the areas that are left behind? Okay, yeah. Um, this is a map of, of joblessness in America. And uh, when I was born in 1967, 5% of prime age males were jobless. Prime age in the US is defined as being between 25 and 54 years, a definition which I increasingly find deeply offensive uh, the, um, uh, as I head, the, head towards the upper boundary of that. Um, in the past 10 years, more than 15% of prime age men have been jobless. So there's been a tripling of that rate. This is probably America's largest unsolved social problem, right? It's, it's happened and we have no idea how to do it. And it's most certainly not geographically neutral. It is concentrated in this area, what I've called America's Eastern Heartland, which starts down in Louisiana and Mississippi, rushes up through Appalachia, and then ends up in the Rust Belt cities. Um, this is what the same graph looked like in 1980. Again, some of the same regional disparities occurred, but it was just at such a lower level. And it's different than not working for, for women. Okay? Not working for women is a north-south divide. And I fundamentally want this discussion to be about men because men who are jobless do different things than women who are, who are not employed. Women who are not employed actually do things like caring for children, caring for sick relatives, doing a variety of social things. Men who are not employed do one thing and one thing only, which is they watch massive amounts of television, right? four hours on average. Right? And they are miserable. There's also a huge difference in the sense that women who are not formally employed, they may be slightly less happy than women who are, form that are formally employed, but it's a tiny difference. Men who are not employed, this shows the gap, right? This is m earning more than 50,000, the share who are really unhappy, earning between uh, 35 and 50, earning less than 50. This is jobless, right? Huge gulf. And the important thing here is that working is related to, not working is related to misery because, in fact, happiness is only vaguely associated with how much money you earn. Right? Whereas not having the social support that comes from that job, not having a sense of purpose in this world, that's actually far more problematic. And that's, that's why this is such a curse. Um, one of the reasons why this joblessness has remained so fixed is that of the long-term employed, 30% of them are living with their parents. And their parents don't seem to be willing to move to a better labor market uh, to do better. Um, 
America has become more European in its, in its uh, regional landscape. American mobility rates have declined precipitously. So we've gone from having 6% of Americans move counties every year to under 4% of Americans moving counties. Um, when people do move, the skilled move out. And this assuredly is true of rural areas in Europe as well, that you have a brain drain. So having everyone move to Amsterdam is not likely to be a feasible solution. Um, and in other ways, we're getting a, more, a greater amount of geographic sclerosis, which is, pos which is also associated with the limits on building in new areas. And you see pictures like this. So this is the not working rate in 1980 for prime age men. This is the not working rate in 2010. And so we need at least some policies to deal with these permanent pockets of lower density joblessness. I think most important around this is education. But in the US, I've certainly come to a place in which I'm more comfortable with employment subsidies that are targeted towards high, high jobless areas. Um, urban density, urban downside number four. Demons of density, most important of this is contagious disease. These are, this is death rates in New York over the last 200 years. A boy born in New York in 1900 could expect to live seven years less than the national average. That's about the same gap as existed in Shakespeare's time between London and the rest of England. Um, today, life expectancy is about three years longer in New York than, in out, than outside. This didn't happen cheaply. It required, above all, investment in clean water. America's cities and towns were spending as much on water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. But infrastructure is not enough, OK? And that's why I want to show you this, that sort of the great piece of infrastructure in New York was the Croton Aqueduct. And as a child, I was raised on this story that said New York was filthy, and then those wonderful engineers came in. And they built the Croton Aqueduct, which took the filthy water out and took the clean water in. And then all of a sudden, New York was a paradise. Well, that story is clearly missing a huge part of the, the, the action, because this is when the aqueduct was built. And for 25 years, the city was still having cholera epidemics. In fact, my great, 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 great grandfather died in that one, in the 1849 cholera epidemic. And the reason for that was exactly the same problem we face in sub-Saharan Africa today, which is the last mile problem. You built the aqueduct, and the poor people still weren't willing to pay to connect. They were too poor to pay for those connections, and so they continued to use the, the, bad, the brackish water from the shallow wells, and they continued to die. It's only in 1866 when the Board of Health requires tenement owners to connect and imposes fines, right? imposes quality of life-based rules that makes people connect that the city starts getting healthier. Cities need rules. And in some sense, in the Netherlands, you have had such a wonderful urban society that has imposed things without any heavy-handed government interventions for so long, right, that you've forgotten that sometimes you actually can't just uh, rely on the community to actually impose everything that keeps quality of life down. You actually may need to have harsh rules, particularly when they're not people from inside your society or people from outside your society. You needed rules. Um, OK, that's about incentives. Uh, I'm just going to say one thing. What, what does that graph show? I, I work on clean water in India. Uh, it's clean water in Zambia. And one of the things that's really fascinating is, is even though they build the, the pipes, they break down constantly. Maintenance is a huge problem. But they don't fix the pipes very quickly. They fix the pipes mostly when people actually pay for the water, when people pay by the liter, rather than when they pay by the month. And so you really need the financial incentives. And that's what that shows, this very strong correlation with percent metered connections. When people pay for the water, then the water company fixes it. When they don't pay for it, then they don't fix it. In terms of driving, it's again, it's about incentives and infrastructure. The fundamental law of highway traffic, as identified by Gilles Duranton and Matthew Turner, shows that the number of vehicle miles traveled increases roughly one for one with the highway miles built. If you build it, they will drive it. You can't just build more roads if you expect your cities to become livable. You have to do something to limit the use of it. And there's no better alternative this than pricing. Singapore has had congestion pricing since 1975. It's the second densest country in the world, and its roads move swiftly. Uh, and if we introduce autonomous vehicles, which lower the cost of sitting in traffic, we will make traffic worse because people are more willing to sit in traffic unless we introduce road pricing from the beginning that makes them pay for the social costs of their actions. Um, I'm going to skip this. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, in many cases in infrastructure, there are two technologies in the developing world. Uh, crime. Uh, in the New York City of my youth, um, crime seemed like it was the great problem. This gives you a, a, just a homicide per 100,000 people over the past 200 years. And you can see, this is when I was born, about here, right? And we just experienced this city, sense that a city was out of control. Um, you still do not have a major crime problem. I mean, I talked to Sylvester, and he said, Ed, you have to say something about crime. We're having a big crime problem in the Netherlands. There's no data that suggests that you're having a crime problem that looks anything like the real crime problems of, of either American cities or anything. But I will say just a few things. This is you know, images from my, from my youth. A few things that we know about crime and fixing crime. Wait. Uh, OK. Uh, one of which is that, so just two observations. Um, 
one of which is that, that m the way that drugs are sold actually matters. And this is a point that came from Brazil, uh, and it came from the impact of the UPP urban pacification program in Rio de Janeiro. Um, it turns out drugs, like most products, you can either sell in the model of the dentist or uh, a, a tailor, whereas you know your provider, and you go to, you call up your, your dealer, and the dealer brings you drugs, or there's a supermarket. You go to an open-air drug market, and you buy stuff. Now, it turns out that one of those models, the supermarket, is vastly more prone to create violence than the other market. And the reason for that is if you take over the supermarket, because they're fundamentally anonymous, you get the business. And so open-air markets for drugs are a recipe for large-scale violence, whereas dealers are not. And what the UPP did is they smashed the open-air markets. Did it do anything to drug consumption in Brazil? No. Did absolutely nothing, because they converted relatively quickly to, to dealers. But drug consumption is a second-order problem relative to large-scale homicide. And so what it did is it, it deterred the homicide, it reduced the homicide by switching the mode in which drugs were sold. Second point, community policing. Um, starting in the 1980s, there was this vision of something called community policing in the United States, which ended up taking two different way, modes in New York and Boston. This is uh, Ray Kelly in New York. You can see he's a tough guy. He's a real New Yorker. Um, community policing meant getting tough on quality of life problems crimes, locking people up for using squeegees, using stop and frisk. It was sort of a very heavy-handed approach. Maybe necessary given New York's large style, but deeply unattractive. And related to the enormous downside of locking up millions of American young men. By contrast, you can see this is Ed Davis in Boston. Ed's like a big teddy bear, okay? And community policing in Boston meant making friends with the community, getting the community to actually tell you who the criminals are. And it's harder, but it's a much more attractive way to deal with crime. And in the case of Ed Davis, a lot of it involved getting young women of color who are on the police force to be the first line of interaction with, with uh, policing. And you know, when you see things like this in the US, where you have this huge battle between the community and the policing, I, I will say that's a sign that no, the policing has gone totally wrong. Because if the policing can't get the community to work for them, right, they fail. And the, the tragedy, so this comes from some work by my colleague uh, Roland Fryer, is w you have these things going on. The police are not doing a very good job to begin with. Right? Then you have this sort of massive protest. And what happens? The police just shut down. They just actually stop doing anything. And as terrible as you know, it is when the police are abusive, uh, the alternative of no police is pretty horrible as well. Right? And both of these things are, are awful. And really, there's only a model of this that is the policing actually connecting with the community and learning from the community. Um, I really don't have time for this. But when, when rule of law fails in cities, it's often the most vulnerable who fail most. And some of my work on gender and trust in Zambia uh, shows that, in fact, it, it is women who suffer particularly in these sort of weak rule of law environments. It, it, this is showing the markets in Zambia. So you can tell these are places of sort of urban creativity, but also relatively low incomes. What happens is in these weak rule of law environments that women go into a few number of industries. They're very low paid industries because they can work with other women. And when you ask them why don't they go into you know, leather and allied product material, it's to say they can't trust the guys that they deal with men and the men are, the men are abusive in a variety of different ways. Um, we talked about the Alfred Marshall quote earlier about learning from each other in cities. One shocking detail from the Zambia data is that male entrepreneurs learn from other male entrepreneurs. Female entrepreneurs have to go to courses because, again, they can't trust working with the men. Uh, and so they're, they're cut off from the urban ability to learn from other people. Now, when you have markets where you have a, a rule of law institution, so this is something that's called a market chief, this is the trust gap outside of markets. This is how much less women cooperate than men do. But if you put women in markets, they start trusting the same amount. And particularly, they trust even more if they're in a market that is uh, dominated by women. Okay? So in fact, you can close this difference, but you need a rule of law institutions that actually the women can trust if they're going to get beyond this. Um, and we actually random, randomly provided access to good rule of law institutions that it had a very large impact for women and not for men. OK, I'm going, to, I'm going to end here. And I just want to, want to end where I began, which is there are lots of difficult things in cities. Rule of law is one way in which cities get out of, get out of control. Bad urban schooling, ghettos that form that isolate people, uh, low quality of life in different ways. But let's not lose our you know, sight on the big picture. For thousands of years, cities have been enabling us to work together. They enabled right, the people of the Netherlands to work together and create uh, the first functional modern republic in Europe, that model which is the, the model for my own republic 400 years ago. Right? Those miracles happen in cities. And when I look around myself, whether or not it's in the urban Netherlands or urban America or even more so in urban Africa, I say to you that the age of urban miracles is not done. Right? It is very much around us. But cities need public policies that can enable growth, that can protect people from abuse, that can enable infrastructure to be moved smoothly, 
and can create a city that is a city that empowers outsiders as well as protects insiders. And that is the job for the 21st century. Let me stop there. But thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Edward. Great. Well, I will invite you back on stage later on. Or is there somebody who has a very urgent question or remark for Edward for this, at this very moment in time? Because I think you gave us a lot, not only to think about, but also to discuss further. For example, how to balance the private and the public sector, because you say we do need rules, things are overcome. But then, yes, how do we keep up from the public and the private sector? Well, there, there is a lot. At least I'm going to ask you later on, but for sure, for sure I can imagine that, uh, that you will join me with that. Maybe then uh, the best is then uh, to step immediately and to give the floor to the elderman of the city of uh, Tilburg, uh, Berend de Vries. And now we are very curious, of course, what your answers are to all the knowledge given to us by Edward, please step forward because the floor is yours. What is Tilburg doing? He says education is key. Education defines quite a bit what you are at the very end. Well, then you are well done with the knowledge institutes here in Tilburg. So, but, but give us some insights. What is on your agenda? How do you provide rules? Because that's apparently a key factor to success. The floor is yours, Berend. Okay, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is um, Berend de Vries and in daily life I work as alderman, vice mayor or in Dutch wethouder at the city of Tilburg and um, responsible for the economic, spatial planning, urban development of our city. But more specifically I'm responsible for the redevelopment of um, uh, the Piershaven uh, district, the Veemarkkwartier, Spoor zone and the Kennis As areas of the city, but more about that later. It's a great honor to uh, have been invited to speak here today after the insp inspiring contribution of you, uh, Professor Glazer. And to the Vrienden of Copenhagen, I say thank you for the invitation. Before I became a vice mayor, I worked at the uh, Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs. Uh, does this work? No. We have to go back a bit. <laughs> Some, um, right. This is this is big bit part of the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. These are my friends. Um, <laughs> the mayor is in the middle. Um, I promised uh, to show this uh, picture picture to you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, because, be, before um, uh, becoming a vice mayor, I worked at the Ministry of Economic Affairs, and prior to that, I worked at the law faculty of this great uh, university, and I am too an alumnus of Tilburg University. Although my acad academic career was fairly short-lived, I've been now um, a vice mayor for almost 10 years. And partly based on that experience, I would like to talk to you uh, today about successful cities, and in particular, the city of Tilburg. But first, and you saw it already, uh, already we start with some facts and figures regarding the history and the future of our city. Um, the history of Tilburg goes back, back a fairly uh, long way. The name of Tilburg uh, appeared uh, in the Liber Aureus in 1191, when a document dating from the year 709 was copied, which reported to have been written in Tilburg also known as Tilliburgus in that time. But despite um, 1,311 years of history, Tilburg as a city is still a relatively recent phenomenon. To be more, more exact, Tilburg, uh, Tilburg acquired its city rights 211 years ago. And still, some people are not convinced of Tilburg's beauty as a city. In Brabant, we have cities like Den Bosch and Breda, which have well-preserved historic city centers and whose influence dates back from many centuries. And then we have cities like Tilburg and Eindhoven, both cities with a similar history. It was not until around the year 1600 that Tilburg started to grow in a serious way. 
um, and that thanks to local sheep farming. Tilburg became a prominent center of commerce in wool, but the oldest known map of Tilburg dating from the uh, 70, uh, uh, 70-60s, um, it still shows that it's agriculture uh, that is, um, was the base of, base of our community. The, the growth of our city really started to take off in the late 19th century due to the mechanization of the textile industry. But around, around uh, 1871, more than 75% of the Dutch wool industry was uh, centered around our town. Employment in, this, in the sector reached its peak in the 1950s when there were um, 12,600 and to be exact, 25 workers. I don't know, but it's really <laughs> um, in, the, in, the, in the industry. But then, a fairly uh, a st a steep decline in the 1960s, the textile industry went, to, went into decline as production moved to countries where wages were lower. This loss was gradually offset by other manufacturing uh, activities and logistics. Today, uh, Tilburg's economy is characterized by its strong manufacturing and logistics sectors. The economic growth drove the continu continued expansion of our city. We go back to um, the agricultural times, uh, but then uh, in a few years, um, you see a, a, a city starting to grow. And now we're almost to the city today. Our city will to continue to grow in the years to come, uh, just like other cities in Brabant. Our city will probably continue to, grow, uh, to attract new residents, and the current projections are that we will, we will reach uh, a quarter of a million uh, um, inhabitants in a few years. This is the growth prediction of uh, uh, all the municipalities in Brabant and the um, big four cities um, have um, a logo. Uh, this is the growth projected for our city um, in the years uh, to come and uh, will reach uh, 250,000 uh, people. But let, let's get back to the characteristics of Tilburg. Tilburg is also a student city, a, st a city with a university and two universities of applied sciences. And the first decision on this was taken over 100 years ago. In 1912, the Catholic Academy was first set up in Amsterdam by Hendrik Moller. This institution then went to Den Bosch in 1913, but they made a mistake. The city council <coughs> at this time were, were not supportive of Moller's ambition to establish a school of commerce uh, as part of the academy. The city of Tilburg was mere, more open to the idea and um, made land available, but was also willing to contribute financially. And Tilburg School of Commerce is the pre precursor of this wonderful university. The academy later merged into what is now known Fontys University of Applied Sciences. The arrival of the academy was an important moment in our history, and it sets the future course of our city as a city for students, a city of creativ creativity. That's one reason why there is today there are around 45,000 students living in our city, 15,000 in secondary uh, education and 30,000 in higher education, um, for instance, this university. The proportion of students in the city, I think, says something about the direction in which Tilburg is moving. Cities with more graduates are more likely to be home to more innovation and more new businesses. But when I read the, uh, the work of Professor Glazer, it seemed difficult to see the link between the cities that are the focus of his work and uh, the country we work and live in, the Netherlands. The largest city in our country, Amsterdam, just has around, and even less, 900,000 inhabitants. That pales in comparison with mega cities like Tokyo, Shanghai, or New York. So how come the Netherlands, even though it has no uh, enormous cities, is still able to create so much added value? The Netherlands is 70, 17th in terms of GDP uh, per capita. 
and the Netherlands also outperforms expectations when it comes to innovation. In recent years, we have been consistently uh, been near the top of the, uh, the list of most innovative countries. You can see uh, here. So one line of reasoning is that despite of its small size, Dutch cities are so successful because it, if you zoom out a bit further, you can actually view them as one large city with multiple centers or hubs. If you take a better look at this picture, uh, the area of Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands are actually one zone, uh, one big urban area with an amount of 30 billion inhabitants. The Tri-City City Initiative, undertaken by, among others, VNO and Zoe, the largest uh, employers organization in the Netherlands, is actually based on the idea that the entire Rhine, Meuse, Schelde Delta is one large city. They've lo looked at this in an interesting way. Um, but you can also view it from this uh, perspective. Um, if you look at the number of inhabitants per square kilometer, you see that the metro, metro area of New York uh, has around uh, 724 people per square kilometer. In San Francisco, 411. Los Angeles, 210. And guess what? The Netherlands has 407 people per square kilometer. So we're sort of in the middle. But our urban centers, and that's a, um, uh, just maybe a challenge, are much less crowded. In Manhattan, there are over 27,000 people per square kilometer. In a city like Amsterdam, there are just around 5,000 people per square kilometer. And Tilburg, let's talk about Tilburg, only 1,870 per square kilometer. Based on um, your work, uh, the, the work of Professor Glazer, that would seem to be a weakness. After all, proximity is an important factor in the success of cities. But at the same time, I think the Netherlands is able to cope with the disadvantages because of the extreme proximity of all the other cities. For instance, if you look at New York, um, not all encounters happen at one place. It only takes, for instance, 12 minutes by train from here to Breda. It only takes 22 minutes from here to Eindhoven and 40 minutes to Rotterdam Central Station. The same time it would take to travel from uh, the World Trade Center to the Bronx Stadium in uh, Brooklyn. At uh, Bronx, sorry. <laughs> um, in 2017, Peter Tordwaar uh, published an update of his earlier study on the on commuting, commuting between cities in Brabant. And you see, see a map that shows the movements between the cities uh, of Brabant. We see similar pictures for shopping, entertainment, healthcare, and edu education. There seems to be evidence of borrowed size. The presence of several cities close together, which reinforce one another because residents can make use of services that other cities have to offer. Together, this, the cities of Brabant form one large city, network of around one million inhabitants. Okay, but what does this mean at a local level for Tilburg? It, I think it, must, uh, it means that we must keep um, the investments um, uh, up for excellent connections between our cities to mitigate the disadvantages of our more diffuse urban area. There's also a need for collaboration, especially between knowledge institutions and businesses. But how do we do that? What is special about this part of Europe? How does cooperation occur? In many Dutch regions, we have triple helix cooperation, meaning that innovation agendas of respectively uh, the business community, knowledge institutions and the public sector are, are harmonized, creating plenty of scope for innovation. There is knowledge transfer between knowledge institution and the business community. The role of government is to encourage and facilitate the formation of these networks. But then again, triple helix collaboration can only succeed if the various partners are sufficiently on an equal footing. The model only seems to work well in um, countries like, like us. Um, if you look at the US, um, there is a more uh, market-oriented uh, um, uh, model. And for instance, China, uh, the, um, the government is more uh, in charge. Okay. 
But let's turn back to our region, back to Tilburg. Along with cities such as Eindhoven, Tilburg is one of the new towns, the towns that sprang up due to the uh, Industrial uh, Revolution. Tilburg was initially and, uh, based on the textile industry, and Eindhoven was uh, dominated by Philips, once famous, famous for its light bulbs. And both cities have also reinvented themselves, uh, just like cities like London, Chicago, and uh, Milan. Tilburg has overcome the decline of the textile industry in the 1960s and Eindhoven too, after a major loss of projection from uh, Philips, has focused on developing uh, its high-tech uh, uh, sector. And both cities are home to strong universities, which were formed and have expanded in parallel with, um, with their uh, development. And I think to a large extent, these universities feed the innovation that is required. In Tilburg, many uh, other manufacturing industries have taken the place of the textile industry and the logistics sector also boomed. In ad addition, a number of large insur insurance companies are based in their city, say said, Interpolis, etc. And yet, Tilburg is, or still is, of, or was, or still is, on a high-risk trajectory, which is related to a low-skilled labor force, first in the textile industry, and later the manufacturing industry and logistics. Fortunately, fortunately, we are in a transition from a less skilled manufacturing city to a more skilled IG producing city. And given the robust knowledge infrastructure and the associated large number of students, 13 to 50% of our population is a student, there are plenty of opportunities and there are lots of small uh, sized uh, companies. The city's knowledge base is in areas such as business, social sciences, digital technology, data science, artificial intelligence, and these are precisely areas in which successful startups have become fast growers in recent uh, decades. And most of the companies that we know today were set up by students, mostly students from this university. But we still have a way to go. A long way, perhaps. In the years to come, we will need to provide space for these new businesses, specifically in the sectors I've just mentioned, because we have a great deal of in-house knowledge, enough physical space for startups and programs that are generated through a close partnership with Brabant's uh, knowledge institutes. That also requires more intense cooperation between the knowledge institutes in Brambles' economic uh, ecosystem. Ladies and gentlemen, I frequently ask myself, how can I contribute to this? What is my role in local government? Because what makes our city attractive? What makes, um, how do we make sure that young people want to live, work and stay in the city? The strategy of our city is to aim to provide a living and working environment that appeals to the kinds of people we would like to bring to our city, while avoiding the pitfalls of excessive gentrification. There are two examples that I would like to highlight, the projects in the Pieshaven and the up, uh, up and coming spore zone area. I remember moving into a new home in the 1990s. I was still a student, those days, and I was lodging with a nice lady, a nice old lady. And I stayed in her loft in the Pieshaven. At that time, the Pieshaven was uh, an area that was a really neglected part of our city. For those who do not know it, it is located at the end point of the Wilhelmina Canal, and by the 1990s, most industry had left. It wasn't an area one would particularly want to go to. Today is a complete different story. The Pius Haver has undergone a complete transformation over the last 10 years. From a neglected backwater to a very lively part of the city. Developers saw its potential, um, but they were not the only ones to play a role. Residents and private individuals also helped to forge a new role for the Pius Haver today and the future. Another good example is the Sporzone area next to the railway line. 
It's an area of 75 hectares right in the heart of the city and close to the, rail, the main railway station. It used to be occupied by railway sidings where the trains were shunted and maintained. And now today it's a bustling area full of places to live and work. There are also places for meeting and culture such as our museums. And of course, you visited it last, uh, uh, yesterday, our renowned Lock Hall, our city library, which was recently proclaimed World Building of the Year. The residents of Tilburg are embracing this location and refer to it as the city's living room. If you haven't been there yet, go. So you can experience for yourself what the power of social reuse can be, uh, mean for buildings. The other strategy of the city of Tilburg is to prioritize the, the transfer of knowledge from our knowledge institutions such as Tilburg University and uh, Fontes uh, and Avance. I mentioned the triple helix agenda. And this is very much our pri priority in Tilburg today. Our agenda, drawn up with knowledge institutions and businesses, focuses on digitization, data science, AI. These are important challenges, alongside the challenges of climate change and the increase in digitization that will have a major impact on our society and the way we do business. New business models are emerging and, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Tilburg needs to be at the forefront of these changes. A good example of the agenda is the partnership between Tilburg University, Fontis and ROC and com companies such as the Persgroep, Zwijzer and Interpolis in the MindLabs project. MindLabs is about AI. And of course, the partnership between Tilburg University and Eindhoven University of uh, Technology in YATS, which is about data science. And given the skill and proximity of our cities, close col collaboration between companies and knowledge institutions from neighboring cities is a must. And it therefore makes me very happy that both the universities and Fontis have announced that they are fully committed to cooperate on uh, an agenda on AI with the support of a large number of companies and cities. I would like to emphasize that Tilburg University is already involved in AI and has around 50 um, staff uh, working on it. Okay, but let's go back to Tilburg. We are planning even more. There's a good reason why a lot of people are talk talking about our city now. In terms of spatial planning, both the Spoorzone, the Kennisas, or Knowledge Access, that extends from Tilburg, Tilburg University to the city centre, will feature that kind of activity. In addition, we will ensure that there is a constant mix of fun functions, businesses, knowledge institutions, residential units and places to meet um, and to enjoy life. And that also means building upwards. West Point, behind me, was built in the 1990s. The tallest residential building in our city and once the highest in the Netherlands. But I have news, more high-rise buildings will be built in coming years. And these are some of the plans that are currently being uh, worked on. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to draw my con contribution to a close. I, have, I hope that I have given uh, some insights into the strategy being pursued by the city of Tilburg. We are well aware that we are part of a whole, and import, uh, a larger of a whole, an important hub in a small country. At the same time, in my role as a servant of the city, I see a trans trans transformation taking place in Tilburg. The, the ambition and capacity to play an important role in today's society is something to work for. And thankfully, I notice an increasing sense of pride in our city. I'm enjoying being a part of this transformation every day. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Berend. Please, Edward, may I invite you back on stage? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for giving these uh, insights. Please be seated. I'm going to... I only have water. I'm going oh, to serve you a glass of water after having given your keynote. I was wondering, Edward, 
um, when Behrendt was showing us the picture of um, the density of the country, he said, it, the Netherlands, it's not a dense country, it's more like an empty city. Now, what, what kind of discussion is this? Because it, I think it's often asked to you, what does this mean? Because we are used to other numbers than you with your examples from the US, or the city in China, 11 million people where they do block and close now airports because of a virus. Uh, I think he's exactly right. I mean, I think this is, this is I mean, uh, certainly when I view either the Netherlands or the Netherlands combined with, with Belgium, it's one large metropolitan area in any reasonable view. It's one that looks different from California, but of course it looks different because it was built on pre-car technologies and then connected by rail as opposed to one large uh, car-based culture. But that doesn't mean it can't be a pers pers you know, perfectly functional, uh, yeah. incredibly robust urban system. It's just one that's built in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have microphones, or you can just yell, wave, whatever, to interact, because uh, I really would appreciate if you participate in this discussion. Is there somebody already who says, well, I take my time now because I have a question? Yes, you? Great. Now, I know that I have some of the colleagues from the Tilburg University who are going around, but first of all, I will run to you with the first question, please. Present yourself and say to whom you would like to address the question. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Angela. I recently obtained my PhD from this university on sustainable cities. And my question is to Professor Glaser. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, I saw in your lecture you mentioned uh, words like cities of innovation, cities as places as consumption. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are, if anything particular, on Sustainable Development Goal 11, for example, and whether that is just a wish list, um, or if that is something that cities can really aspire to, given how important development and economic development is, in contrast to environmental or social aspects. Uh, so, so great question. Thank you. And, and I, cut my, I cut my sustainability slide because it was already going on too long, but that doesn't suggest that it, it is incredibly important. I think the first order thing is that cities are often depicted as being the enemy of the environment, but of course the opposite is true. That when we look, uh, and I've done work together with Matthew Kahn, uh, currently of Johns Hopkins, an environmental economist, and we assess the carbon footprint of households living in different parts of the U.S., and the punchline is the places that look green are brown and the places that look brown are green. And uh, urban density is a, is a recipe towards higher levels of sustainability for two primary reasons, one of which is just smaller distances uh, traveled. And in the US, this means not taking the bus most of the time. This actually just means shorter drives. So it's driving you know, 10 minutes instead of driving 50 minutes. But that, that adds up in terms of uh, gallons pretty darn quickly. Um, and secondly, it's about smaller living spaces, even holding income and family size constant. So it is certainly true that taller towers are more in energy intensive than large, you know, uh, single family detached dwellings. But typically people occupy much smaller apartments when they live in those areas. And so they have to heat and cool those areas with much less energy. So um, urbanization is not an enemy of the environment. Uh, it's really a friend. And, and one way to sort of make these numbers more dramatic is if the great growing economies of India and China see their per capita carbon emissions levels rise to that scene in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by 130% because of that factor alone. If they stop at the level seen at wealthy but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by only 30%. So that's really a huge gulf. And it, it says that urban density has really something to contribute towards taming our carbon emissions. The second point is, from a US perspective, um, Europe looks pretty green to begin with. Certainly, we've got a lot of work to go to, catch, to catch up with you. Um, and probably has relatively little direct impact in terms of your carbon emissions on the future of carbon emissions in the world relative to what's happening in India, China, Sub-Saharan Africa, which, is, which are places that are poor, have incredibly tough climates, and you know, we hope that they will become richer, and consequently they will do the things that rich people do elsewhere, which is they buy air conditioning and they buy cars. And this will create vastly more pressure than anything that you, you do in Europe in terms of your direct carbon use, yeah. which means that the most important thing that can happen in the Netherlands for the future of climate change is what solutions you come up with that will be stolen by Africa, by China, by India, right? That in fact, it is the ideas that are produced here that will be borrowed elsewhere that are what really matters. So whatever you do, don't add up 
like what are the carbon emissions here, add up, will this actually be translated? And if it's translated, how much of an impact will it have? And yeah. I think that's the sort of central thing. So, I, and I don't okay. want in any sense to take away from the thing that carbon emissions are incredibly important, incredibly central, mm -hmm. and not that you shouldn't be working on it, but you have to have a global perspective because yeah. if you're just adding up local stuff, you're missing the main point. Yeah. And then we must make sure that it will not be stolen from us, but that we do sell it at a good price if we do come up with the right technology, <laughs> don't we? Uh, that's, that's right, that's right. Uh, uh, yeah. Although uh, I, I certainly, you know, an economist, I believe in property rights. Uh, exactly. Absolutely. But from an environmental perspective, it's okay if it's stolen. So. Yes. <laughs> that is true, which is so true, which is so yeah. true. Now, now Ed, um, Berendt was saying that we as, a, um, as policymakers, we try to provide, that this is how you said it, literally living and working environment to the people we want to attract. And then you defined it further down that you said we want to be in the forefront of the new technologies like uh, digitalization, um, artificial intelligence, data science, and so forth. Is this feasible? Is this the way things do go? Can you say as a city, a municipality, government, this is the people I would like to attract? Well, I think very much the job of, of city government is to attract and train smart people and then more or less to get out of their way, right? I think that's the right, that's the right sort of economic development mantra. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's not clear which are always the right people, yeah. but uh, certainly education is a pretty good predictor of, of something mm -hmm. that, you, that you want, uh, unquestionably. Uh, a certain diversity of skills are valuable. Um, I think with industrial policy, you've always got to be a little bit careful because mm -hmm. it's often difficult to figure out what was, I mean, we, I'm 100% on the, view that Tilburg wants to be at the, at the industries that are cutting edge of the world. That's clearly right. But what everybody exactly wants though, this. Other universities as well. Absolutely. And yeah. it's not totally clear what will be. Uh, but um, so it, it's, you need to be a little bit careful with industrial policy. But I think in general, this cooperation with universities is part of the training and attracting mission that I think is a sensible thing for local government. Okay. Uh, but you're right. You're competing with the world. That is absolutely yes. right. Uh, but you have assets, you have great universities, you have smart people, you have a great quality of life. All of these things are ones which make you, I think, globally competitive. Okay. I think that I, I but maybe I'm wrong, but I think that you, 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 tr you said to us that cities in the very end should be able to pay for themselves. Did you say something similar? I or? said that people should pay for the social costs of their actions, but I think it follows from that mostly that cities should pay for their, their costs too. Are you able to pay for yourself? Uh, as a city? Well, we are um, in a situation that we do not um, uh, fund ourselves because um, that's organized on a national level. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the, the expenses that we have, uh, there's. Um, but I mean there's, also there's, tax there's, wise, because that was what you were saying as well. You, you should pay for usage if it's land, oh, if yes. it's buildings, if it's, sure. if it's roads, if it's whatever. Uh, are you able to do so, or yeah. is the Dutch structure so, is it hampering this? Well, there, there are quite a few problems with how we organize our government. It comes from the times that we drove horses and not cars. So the way we created our government is, dates back from those times, mm -hmm. the 1850s, around that period. So there, and if you look at uh, our government from a perspective of, of a city, we're not well organized because um, uh, the, most cities um, uh, have a relatively a small uh, uh, par part of what you may call the, the metro area of a city, mm -hmm. which they are, are allowed to govern. And the rest is governed by other municipalities, province, and even our national uh, uh, government. So. It's not a very efficient and focused way of governing. Um, but we've tried and discussed uh, rede redesigning government in the Netherlands for ages. Mm -hmm. So I'm not very optimistic about changing this. Yeah, okay. Now, can, now, can I just try? Yes, that's, please, a, that's a great please. question. I want to actually say, say yeah. it. So, so the, the Netherlands, like many European countries, has a large national share relative to local share, and often local expenses are funded by transfers from the national government. Mm. Um, it is appropriate that the national government pays for expenses which are, by and large, redistribution to take care of poor people. 
right? In fact, if you make local governments responsible for all the poor people that live there, typically the rich people just run away. So it's in order to, to avoid having to pay those expenses. So you really do have a, have to have a national focus on that. For other expenses, typically economists think that a greater local share is actually advantageous. And that means instead of using national tax transfers, having, let's say, for example, higher property taxes to pay for local, yeah. local infrastructure improvements, and indeed, for many cases, having user fees, fees fund them. And, and I think I'm, I'm glad that the Netherlands is thinking about that. It's, it's certainly worthwhile to having, to having analyzed such an option. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. There's this, this discussion going on right now. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, I'm not very uh, optimistic about the results. <laughs> no, okay. Now, now you were emphasizing on the fact that we should try at least to better align the public and the private sector, because if not, then we do uh, cause problems at the very end, um, and then for sure um, quality of life will be at stake. Now, one of the answers I think you were giving to this um, challenge, Berend, was that you said we try to work as much as we can in the triple helix. So we try to align um, government with knowledge institutes, with the entrepreneurial um, part of our society, even maybe with society in itself, the citizens. Is that the answer, would you say, to this very important task that we better align the public and the private? Is it in the triple helix so or the, the quadruple the, helix? So, so let me tell you, what, what, what I, when I heard the triple helix, let me tell you what I thought was, was so useful about this. What it seemed to me was this was a government leader who was uh, uh, making the case that for thinking about growth, for thinking about not just current businesses, but new businesses, for not being focused as economic development czars so often are on, can I get this one factory to open? And so they, they, they mark themselves on one factory rather than creating an, an ecosystem that is, mm -hmm. that is part of that. And that, that, that was absolutely great. Um, the, 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 the thing that's not part of the, the alderman's remit, which is critical to this, are other elements of quality of life, which are then critical to attracting employees and to attracting businesses. So there's lots of public policy that relates to attracting businesses that's not called economic development policy. Often, quality of life policy is economic development policy. Policing policy is economic development policy. Because in fact, if you don't have an area that is exciting to live in, you're not going to attract the type of people who are going to start businesses that, are, that you want to be started. Okay, yeah. Yes. Oh, there is somebody. There's one of the representatives from the university is coming over. Please tell us who you are and what you would like to ask. Um, good afternoon. My name is Geert Lamerichs. I'm an uh, economics master graduate student of this university. Thank you both for your presentations. Um, I was wondering, uh, Mr. Glazer, in your uh, presentation, you talked about the, the importance of cities in, in that you can talk to other people and you can learn from other people and then also education. And um, within the Netherlands and also in the US, there's an increasing segregation within school districts. And so I was wondering what the segregation in learning has a foreign effect on the, 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 the prosperity of the city and the, and the future in growth. And then making the connection to a more developing world. I was in Uganda in 2016 and 2017. And there you saw that a lot of people from the, 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 the rural areas were moving to the more urban areas because they felt as if they could learn more, but if that segregation would still hold because coming into a new city, you can't really uh, get into the, the, the economic heart of it very easily. So what does the segregation there mean for economic development? Okay, segregation school-wise and with newcomers. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I showed you yeah. the graph, so I, I'm, I consider that comment to be entirely you know, right on. Um, the, I, I showed you the graph which showed lower levels of opportunity in more segregated cities in the U.S., right? And it is absolutely true that more segregated cities have typically failed, particularly African-American uh, children. Um, I, I would say more generally, uh, America's system of schooling where, the, the, where you live determines where you go to school, and if you want a better school, you move to the suburbs, has been an absolute curse on providing opportunity in uh, urban areas. Typically, European cities and, and cities in the Netherlands have not fallen into the same curse. Your, your schooling, particularly for poor kids, is much better, which is why upward mobility is much higher here than it is in the US. Um, but obviously, you, you always want to watch for that. You always want to make sure that your, your cities are providing schools not just for the smartest, but also for those people who start with less. And uh, certainly, the rising immigrant populations create more challenges. But at least from my perspective, I understand I'm supposed to like 
tell you to tell, give you solutions. But I think we have a lot more to learn from you than the reverse. I mean, in fact, you seem to be doing an incredibly good job with immigrant populations relative to, let's say, the United States. Uh, so it, it's, it, it'll behooves me to, to give out lessons on this, but it, it's, it's a really important thing. Now, Uganda, uh, the, the movement of urban to rural, uh, rural to urban migrants is, of course, one of the great phenomenon of the 21st century, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what we do know from Afrobarometer is that kids who spend more time in cities end up being more literate and end up being more educated. So despite the failings of uh, city school districts or city schools in sub-Saharan Africa, they are a lot better than rural schools. Um, the issue of distractions is still there. So one graduate student I advise works on street children in Delhi. And one, in some, some cases, those cities, those children actually get less education than they did in the rural areas because there's more money to be earned begging on the streets in Delhi than there was in the rural area that they left behind. Um, despite the fact that actually Delhi schools are better than other areas. But this issue of making sure that cities are not just places of current productivity but of long-run opportunity is absolutely central. And segregation is part of the answer, but it's also about making sure that the bottom, the lower end of education everywhere, no matter what neighborhood you're living in, is lifted in the urban area, particularly for the most vulnerable citizens, particularly for, for immigrants. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. You, you wave at Mia if you have a question. I was wondering, you said um, more than once in your keynote that cities do need rules. We, we do need a set of rules how to get along with each other. How difficult is it to set rules also when it comes to urban growth? Well, we are in, we live in, in a very regulated country uh, mm -hmm. where our province um, um, sort of dictates what we can uh, uh, build uh, based on demographic models. This sounds so sad. Yes, uh, <laughs> but then again, uh, th there's, uh, well, it's not bad, um, uh, completely bad, because in the end it just follows what the market of um, uh, consumers or uh, people who want to live somewhere um, mm -hmm. uh, does. One of the problem is that uh, there's, it, the, mo the model is not is not right at the moment that we have to use it because yeah. there's there, there's a, a time difference between when things occur and uh, uh, lots of migrants go to uh, our province for instance yeah. and then a few years later the, pro the province reacts and then we have to build we, we, we have to we have to build houses now so that's that's sli slightly a problem but then again um, uh, we don't want to have the problems that uh, Spain had in uh, the recession. Uh, they built, built houses and built houses and built houses and then the whole market imploded. So there's, there needs to be some, some set of rules, um, but yeah, we, we over-regulated it, uh, it a bit. Because it's, it's quite difficult to set exactly the right set of rules and not to hamper the growth, because that is, that is the risk you do take constantly, but that, that, so what, what could you, you You're say absolutely to this? right, right, so, so it's, it's, let me be more precise. You don't just need rules, you actually need the right rules, okay? You, yeah. you, you actually just, yeah. the goal is not to put random rules down no. and expect that they, they do well. Obviously, I've made it clear that it, in many cases, I think there are too many rules on building new housing, right? And it is not, in any sense, I wanna be clear about this, I'm not an advocate that anyone should live in a tall building. I'm an advocate that there shouldn't be, shouldn't be as many rules to prevent people from building tall buildings when it's appropriate. Uh, mm -hmm. when, there's a, when there's a way to demand it. In the case of most forms of entrepreneurship, right, I think almost surely most of the markets that I've looked at have far too many rules that prevent entrepreneurship. And what is particularly appalling, and I believe this is true in Europe, but it's very clearly true in the US, that we regulate the entrepreneurship of poor people so much more strictly than we regulate the entrepreneurship of rich people. If you are a smart, well-educated MIT or Harvard or University of Tilburg uh, student, you can start your internet phenomenon in your, in your room and there will be yep. no regulators looking over your eyes. And in some sense, the internet, cyberspace, has created this vast regulation-free zone that is empowered powered innovation and entrepreneurship over the last 30 years. By contrast, because they're not coders, right, kids who grow up in poverty, you know, a few miles away, they have to be entrepreneurs in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. And in the real world, there are a lot of rules. And so if you're five miles away from Harvard and you want to start your grocery st store that sells milk products, you need 15 permits to go through to get through and doing that. And that is somewhat outrageous. And that's sort of, you know, mm. getting those, that balance of right. The area is where I think it's sort of, it's clear that you want rules are the really simple areas. And I'll give you a clear example, which is, and you can decide, you can ask whether you think this is relate, related to uh, firecrackers on New Year's Eve in, in, uh, in the <laughs> Netherlands itself. We told but, you uh, about the, this, the, uh, yeah. But for example, one of the issues, sort of you want 
wander through the Dar Avi slum of Mumbai, which is one of the most entrepreneurial places on the planet, right? And it's entrepreneurial in part because no one's imposing any rules on anything. And you know, it's full of people doing amazingly creative things. And you walk out after seeing one of these entrepreneurs and you see a child defecating in an unpaved road. Right? And this is a real issue in urban India, is, is open street defecation. Uh, often, it's not that there aren't you know, latrines that are available, it's not that there aren't stalls, but the children are just choosing to defecate on the street. Now, there are a, a number of interesting economics papers about changing culture, but I don't really know how to change culture. I, I know how to impose rules. And so I, I think actually a reasonable model is when a child you know, or anybody defecates on a road, that there's some penalty. Now, uh, because I try to be reasonably humane, even though my kids would tell you otherwise, uh, my, my uh, you know, my, my proposed solution is that when a kid defecates in an unpaved road, they have to spend two hours doing math homework in a community center, right? So that's my, which again, if you were my kids, you would argue that's cruel and inhumane punishment, but I think probably the downside is, is relatively limited. But you need something that is about limiting the sense that we can cause harm to our neighbors, and you need some set of rules about that. Yeah. And you can make up yourself about the fire. Yeah, yeah, maybe the, uh, we, we, we <laughs> yeah. it's free. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, yes, please. Hi, uh, I'm Florian Snickers. I'm an assistant professor of economics here at this uh, university. Um, thank you for your talks. I have a question to Professor Glazer. Um, you spoke about the centripetal and the centrifugal uh, forces for cities. Um, the complexity is likely to remain. Uh, do you have any predictions for possible centrifugal technolo technological developments, like how is the self-driving car going to impact or is public transport more likely to improve much more in cities, such that cities are going to be even more attractive? What do you think of these balances of forces for the future? So uh, self-driving cars I alluded to, I think of them ha as having you know, two paths, depending upon whether or not we regulate them properly. Um, if they are regulated inefficiently, meaning if we just let people sit and drive in them, I think they will make cities worse. I think they, because by lowering the cost of sitting in traffic, because you can now work while you're sitting in traffic, more people will sit in traffic and urban traffic jams will get more problematic. Consequently, they will probably be centrifugal technologies if that occurs, meaning that what you'll see is more people will actually, you know, self-driving cars will still be able to function on low density highways and so people will be driving long distances, but not in cities because they're just crowded out of existence. If conversely, they are handled in a, in a functional regulatory regime that installs a GPS-based road tolling system at all you know, points that actually makes sure that actually they can move effortlessly around the city, enabling road sharing in a, in a smart way. Then they could certainly be a very effective uh, centripetal technology instead and provide urban mobility in a, in a quite effective, effective manner. But the choice is up to the governments. Right? There are two paths which can be followed. Um, in terms of public transportation more generally, uh, I, I tend to think, at least in the US context, the big open question is buses that in fact it's unlikely that given US density levels that rails are, are the future. Where, and there's not a lot that you can do on a, with a rail that you can't use with a bus on a dedicated lane. After all, bus rapid transit has been one of the great transportation innovations in the developing world that has provided mass transit at a lower cost for uh, ordinary residents of, of Brazil and, and elsewhere. Um, and the question is whether or not we're gonna see a revolution in autonomous buses, autonomous electric buses, autonomous electric buses on, on dedicated lanes uh, that have you know, constant Wi-Fi and are you know, fun and exciting, that could work. And that could be something that you know, could provide even more mobility throughout this amazing urban region than you currently have with rail, that sort of smaller mm -hmm. towns. So you, you, have the, you have the rail comes in, and then you have autonomous buses connecting to smaller urban centers or areas within Tilburg that are not, not quite at the rail mm -hmm. center, but connects off of it. So, but again, it depends upon you know, the right regulation and visionary public leadership. Mm. Yeah, we have tests like this at the automotive companies. Yes, there's another question here. Um, I have one over here in front. Yep, thank you. Hey, my, uh, my name is Robin Kuipers, and I have a question for our elder man. Um, so if you times during your presentation you mentioned the uh, knowledge access or Genesis us and now in, in many um, university cities in the Netherlands you have the university sort of scattered throughout the city you have a building there and a building there uh, whereas in Tilburg it's, it's really focused on on a campus at the you know at the edge of the city basically and um, personally I, re I really like the, the feeling that you're walking on a campus and that you're really Walking on, you know, college grounds, um, but this this idea of, of knowledge access kind of draws the 
university into the city center. Uh, so I was wondering, what's the, what's the, what's the purpose of this? What's the vision behind okay. this, this idea? Some more words on the Knowledge Act. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the discussions with um, the Board of University, we concluded that uh, this university is growing, expanding, and in the end you can uh, build this beautiful landscape with uh, beautiful buildings um, and uh, add new buildings to it, or you have to expand. Uh, you cannot expand into the woods because it's a monument. Don't, don't touch the woods. Um, so the only way is to build um, uh, um, in the direction of the city center. And the whole idea of the, uh, the knowledge access uh, and the study with it we did is that the beautiful environment you have here will be copied um, in the direction of the, uh, the city center, um, but with one exception that it will be more a mixed uh, use uh, area than it is uh, here. Um, and that has one uh, advantage, uh, is that um, we know that these areas are more, well, um, uh, the, the, the chance of more uh, innovation and uh, mixed use um, uh, is probably going to help um, um, that. Um, that's why we want to have the mixed use environment in the spore zone, for instance. So in the end, with the beautiful spore park in the middle, um, I think about this area as one big uh, campus, not now, but in 10, 20 uh, years uh, to come. And then you can wander on, uh, you can walk on uh, college uh, grounds from here to the city centre. Yeah. I, d I was wondering, uh, is this an answer to your question? Yeah? Okay. I was wondering, because at the end you were showing us in fact, a, a bit of the new skyline or what Tilburg will become because deci apparently decisions have been made that new constructions will be uh, high rise. Now you are in this function for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Could you have imagined 10 years ago when you started as an elderman that now Tilburg would construct and build high rise buildings? Um, well, we have uh, already the West Point building. Oh, yeah, yeah. you have some, uh, sure. But um, uh, no, we were uh, building uh, the, the so-called dorsal uh, boning. Uh. Yeah. Um, Do you know what a the typical, dorsal boning is? A typical, no, no, I, I don't have a, trans I a, don't have a, a typical either. Dutch building. And uh, uh, the thing is, just a, 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 a house with a small front yard and a, 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 a smaller, also a small backyard. Uh, but um, the, <laughs> the, li the living room has one window at the, the, the street and one window um, uh, at the, you the, the backyard in and you one, can look in one through. one glimpse yeah, yeah. of the eye. Yeah. Door zone. Um, <laughs> so, I've heard an explanation so um, well. The translation we'll do, we'll do at the drinks. Um, but we have, we've been yeah. um, a, 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 um, a champion of door zone voting. Uh, yeah. We have in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah. I, show, I show the map, build those houses um, yeah. Now in various uh, uh, forms. Um, and the, the choice is, do we want to um, add more uh, urban space to our city? Uh, if you know that there are less people uh, living in a house, mm -hmm. uh, that means that you have even uh, lesser people in a, a square mile or a kilometer. Services will be uh, difficult to, uh, to uh, organize uh, in those uh, places. We already have in some places, in some neighborhoods, difficulties to uh, ensure that there is enough uh, uh, shopping uh, available, etc., etc. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the choice is, do we keep on building doors on uh, voting and end up with a city that is not functioning well or go up uh, sky high? Yeah. You do and, agree and, with and, this uh, idea. And, uh, and, we, we, and where there's beautiful landscape around our city, yeah. uh, uh, which is uh, fun to be in. Um, mm -hmm. So um, um, and that's... that's, uh, that's you, you have once stated too many people too close to nature is a real risk for nature. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, too. too. I, have, I have said yeah. that, that in fact, one of the key... So I, I often tell the story about Henry David Thoreau, who's the secular saint of American environmentalism, but few people know that in his youth, he also burned down more than 200 hectares of forest land uh, because he was having a picnic in the middle of the woods. And uh, the, 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 uh, the point of this is that we're a destructive species, and often if you love nature, you should stay away from it. 
it, as indeed Thoreau could have done a, uh, which, which is something of an argument for urban consolidation. And it goes with this point of if you move people closer together, they emit less carbon than if you spread them out over space. But all of this, these other points are right, too. right? Very low density dwellings with smaller households mean that you, know, you can't support local services. services, you can't support. Uh, and there's just a lot to like about the ability to build up. And this doesn't mean that everyone should live in a high rise. I mean, again, we're not trying to socially manage things. But when demand is there for higher density dwellings, when demand is there for a higher building, uh, you know, you're going to have to work yeah. hard to convince me that you shouldn't allow those buildings to be, to be built. Great. It is. You are the one who will ask the last question because it's about time. I'll try to stick on that. Oh, yeah. There is a colleague coming over. Maybe there are other people who really do insist in asking their last question or giving a remark. But first, it's up Thank to you. you. Um, yeah, my question is about... Who uh, are you? Oh, my name is Viviana. I okay. live in Rotterdam, but I'm from Ecuador. Um, but my question is about um, the public space and how it affects the economy in the urban areas. Because for me, uh, the encounters in the public space are very important as well. So for example, if you compare that, okay, people is together in LA, but they go in the car and then they're together in a small building in California, it's totally different to what happens in New York where you have these encounters in the street. So how much should cities and should developers pay attention to the way in which they develop the public space in order to you know, okay. create these uh, human Encounter. interactions that make cities so valuable? Yeah. It's, it's a great question. It's a great and, and important question. And there, there are questions about sort of the parks that, that we love and when is the right answer to have a large park like Central Park that creates sort of a real vast oasis or small parks that are scattered throughout. When is it right to actually require buildings to create plazas in front that people then use as public space. This is one of the big decisions of New York City zoning law in 1960, was they used to have a system in which all the New York City buildings had to get narrower as they got taller, and this was because the primary fear of the 1916 zoning law was to create more light on the street. After 1960, they moved to an area in which you got height by creating plazas in front, which is why you, when you see the sort of modern buildings in New York, they often have these plazas. There's a great book by the great Holly White called The City, which actually d details his work of sort of showing how much these plazas are used and what different spatial attributes are, are lend the plazas to get more used and, and less used. We're just at a place in which we're actually getting a social science of this, meaning that we now can measure using cell phone usage of how people interact with each other, let alone the sort of larger question, which is how much does it change someone's worldview if they're constantly sealed up in a, in a world in which it's car to office and going home versus if they actually are interacting with mm -hmm. people on a subway or in a space. So social science is still a long way from being able to give a, a hard nose to this. And in fact, we often have to go off of the inter intuition of planners and architects. But I will tell you personally, my sort of feelings of, of, of a city and sort of my you know, observations suggest that these public spaces are incredibly important and that you don't know a city unless you've walked it and you don't get to see how a city works unless you see how people interact in these you know, magical public interactions which are unplanned and are going on uh, in those urban areas. So I, I think you're exactly right. I think it is actually important. But I also wanted to sort of say from the social science perspective, like, this is a huge agenda for the, for the future. It's sort of shocking that we don't actually have hard data that tells us the impact of these things beyond sort of the very narrow things like what is the impact of Central Park on local property values near, nearby. I can tell you that answer, and it's positive, but I can't tell you sort of the more interesting questions that go beyond that. Mm, great. Well, some investigation to be done huh? on this subject. Yeah. OK, now I look once more if there is a final question, a remark. If yes, then I think you will be the one. And then we go to the second reason of being together, and that means networking. My name is Baudwin Havgort. I'm dean of the Tilburg School of Humanities and Digital ah. Sciences. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert at all in, in this field. I have an open question. Um, I, I read these days about things like urban agriculture and urban uh, manufacturing, small-scale urban manufacturing. And I would like to hear whether Tilburg has a view on that or whether there is a more global view from, from Professor Glazer on this. OK, who goes first? Berend. Uh, we, we don't have a, um, um, a, a policy uh, on that uh, subject. We do support initiatives um, now and then, but they're some small scale uh, with um, low impact on manufacturing and, and food production, for instance, but sometimes a high impact on social interaction. So that's why we sometimes support them. Okay. But that's uh, the main focus we have on this issue. 
Okay. So, uh, I, the, so I certainly don't have any problem with someone who wants to buy space on the free market and use it for agriculture or any form of manufacturing in cities. Uh, it's less clear that, they, that this serves some larger social good, and I'll take both of them in, 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 in turn. Manufacturing was a natural urban phenomenon when the land, when the space used in manufacturing was modest. So when Henry Ford started his plant, he had about 20 square meters per worker. Now, uh, manufacturing plants like that are typically at 200 uh, meters per worker, right? So that level of space per worker is deeply non-urban, right? And that is the form, high levels, of manuf high levels of machines, robotics, that modern manufacturing looks like. So any sort of you know, large-scale manufacturing for the global market is unlikely to be urban, and especially since the one-time advantage of cities, which is proximity to the, to the transportation networks, that's largely eliminated. And we shouldn't be wishing to get that back. I mean, for 30 years, we spent time wishing to, that, to get that back, and that was a, that was a foolish uh, chimera. If there's a bunch of small-scale manufacturing of doing some soaps in the urban area, and people think it's special because it's soap that's made in Tilburg, I don't have an opinion on that, but it's not going to be you a do. source of... of <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's nice, it's not a, but it's not, it's not a long-run economic thing one way or the other. It's sort of a small-scale niche product that may exist. I feel the same way about ur urban agriculture, which is if you want to have some local community gardens that educate kids, this is where your tomato comes from, this is whatever, that's great. I mean, I think it's wonderful for kids to see plants. I I think a little bit of greenery is a great thing. But don't pretend as if urban agriculture is some solution to actually feeding either the city or the planet. And it's even kind of, large scale agriculture is kind of terrible from an environmental perspective to put in the cities. And the reason is that the carbon involved in moving food is very modest. The carbon involved in moving people is huge. And so if you use land and you put the land in the middle of where the people live, you're pushing the people farther apart and you have to move them a lot more. And so the overall carbon impact of saving this trivial amount uh, that you save by having to, the, the tomatoes right there as opposed to move, move to a couple hundred kilometers is overwhelmed by orders of magnitude from the fact that someone has to commute an extra couple of miles just every day in terms of this. So, you know, it's fun, it's nice, but don't think it's sort of, suddenly we're going to have wheat fields in the middle of Tilburg and that's going to look, that's going to look <laughs> sensible. The, uh, Great, well, thank you for this answer. The, uh, <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think we have something to, uh, to talk over during drinks. Is this an okay model. answer <laughs> to your great open question? Yes. Well, then I, I'm going to thank you all once more for attending this fourth lecture of the Vrienden van Kopenhagen. It was great to have you all here. I hope you have gathered some new information, some new insights when it comes to urban growth, uh, as well from the general perspective. And then we had the finest uh, men, I would say, uh, here with us in person of Edward Glazer. Thank you so very much. And also Berend de Vries. We all know everything now about the strategy from the city of Tilburg. Thank you so much. So I do kindly invite you because I don't think there will be a final address from somebody from the university. No? Is it to me to invite you all for the drink? That's then what I will do. I kindly invite you and I ask you to give a last warm round of applause for these two gentlemen. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you, Belle. Thank you.